You're listening to 1232, an audio epic produced by Rumble Stump Entertainment. This episode of 1232 is sponsored in part by Oasis Family Media and its family of companies, including Oasis Audio, Enclave Publishing, and Sky Turtle Press. Publishers of the forthcoming epic, Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen, rendered in modern prose by Rebecca K. Reynolds and illustrated by Justin Girard. For more information, visit fairyqueen.com. That's fairyqueen.com. Or find the link in the description below. Looking for quality loose leaf teas and coffee? Look no further than atticustea.com. Use our promo code 1232 for 32% off your first order of the finest tea and coffee from atticustea.com. Chapter 17 Another overcast and rainy dawn settled in the Brecon countryside. Rona had been up before daybreak, helping Scarlet water the horses. They fixed a new picket line to graze the herd among the trees. It rained most of the night. Poured, actually. Rona slept dry, but only because Cardigan insisted she sleep in the cave. The men, bedded down in the thicket, got little sleep in the deluge. Rona's rest had been rudely interrupted, however, when Flint came into the cave making a racket and made his bed next to hers, whispering his complaints against chivalrous nonsense. This cave was small, just big enough for some stores and a few people, unlike the larger cave where the wounded were. There was only one way in or out, and that was through the narrow opening that pointed north. Its entrance was concealed in thick briars, and only a small ledge allowed access. The hill that housed the cave provided a challenging climb to any attackers. In the meadow below, they had picketed half the horses. The other half were in a grassy valley half a mile away up the hill. The forest was thick all around, and only small clearings scattered about lent any sort of perspective. A waterfall that fell straight out of a hole in the mound's side fed the wide stream that ran into the river Usk in the valley. The whole hill concealed an unknown network of caverns. Rona was between the meadow and the cave, watching Flint step out of the nearly invisible entrance. He stretched and yawned, humped over due to the dampness. From the west, a loud ram's horn broke the stillness. People started running and shouting. The priest came flying into the meadow, bailing off his horse, carrying little Daphid. They were headed in her direction. Before long, Rona was running too. An entire company of black riders rode into the meadow, firing their crossbows at anything that moved. Several of the black horses were shot, and three of the black riders charged through them, slashing the ropes, even the horses themselves. Just hearing the horses screaming filled Rona's heart with terror. Priest Michael sprinted by her, and she recognized Daphne. What is he doing here? Where's Karin? Rona asked. Flint found out in the first few seconds of the attack, how frightening arrows sounded flying by his head. The next thing he knew, Rona was in his face, yelling for him to get a sword. He was overwhelmed. He hadn't been awake 10 minutes when the Black Riders attacked from both the forest and the meadow. Little to no shouting could be understood, but the clang of impact, sword on sword, sword on flesh, arrows finding a place to rest. And for every blow that landed, An echo of each clash rang across the valley. Everyone was running. Rona grabbed Flint's arm, and together they ran downhill, where a cluster of rebels, including Cardigan, Ed, and Smith, stood off a charge of cavalry. The men had no shields, but bravely stood their ground, pulling back riders off their horses. Rona's instinct took her where she sensed she was needed most. As they got closer, she realized She didn't know what to do. A dagger is a far cry from a pistol for a sidearm. Look! Flint yelled in her ear. She turned. Flint wanted her to see dismounted black riders advancing up the steep hill to the cave entrance. If they got there first, Cardigan and the others would be cut off. Rona and Flint both had the same idea. They turned and ran back, stationing themselves on the ledge. Rona's heartbeat wouldn't stop pounding in her ears. From the corner of her eye, she caught movement. Some of the more able wounded, led by little Daphid, 
were standing outside the cave, exposed to enemy arrows, chunking rocks at the black riders that were climbing up. Flint's throat tightened at the thought of Daffod getting hit, but neither he nor Rona had enough time to stuff the kid back into the cave. The first wave of enemy soldiers had made it to the ledge. They tried to swing at them, but the ledge was too narrow to allow them to fight side by side. Back to back, Flint cried, but this didn't compensate for their poor abilities. They blocked well enough, but neither of them could handle the weapon with skill necessary to strike. With at least four black riders coming at once, they would soon be overwhelmed, with little to slow them down but the stones that Daffod and the others were throwing. While Flint and Rona defended the entrance, Hardian and the others got the upper hand on the cavalry below. Enough bowmen had received the alarm in time to station themselves behind tree trunks and rocks. A few of the archers climbed above the cave entrance and fired at the enemy attacking the cave. Hardigan and Smith had both commandeered horses and met steel for steel with the rest. Scarlet emerged from the cave behind Rona and Flint. She was perfect with a bow, which she used until her quiver was empty. Then she fought with a sword and dagger. Rona wouldn't have noticed her at all, except for the sudden realization that Scarlet's arrows had prevented a sword blow from ending Rona's life. To Flint and Rona, the battle was already lasting too long. Flint's arms couldn't take another blow, and neither could his face. He'd been punched a couple of times and could feel the blood running down from his cheekbone. Rona's ribs screamed every time she parried a sword hit. Her breath would catch in her lungs each time she raised her arms. The twins were rushed by a black rider, separating their defense. Rona leapt aside just in time, but Flint fell back from the attack. Rona rushed to defend him. Her valiant effort cut short by a blow to her nose from a flailing elbow. It looked bad for Flint just then. Another black rider, bigger than the others, climbed onto the ledge. From his belt, he drew a battle axe that must have weighed a ton. Flint looked up, out of breath, to see the battle axe swinging down at him. He rolled onto his back and raised his sword toward the coming impact. The blow glanced off and buried the axe in the rocky ground, sending sparks flying. Flint's teeth clattered from the jarring and his sword broke. He now scrambled to his knees, trying to get close to Rona again. Rona's opponents were quick. She jumped up onto a rock and met another blade that got dangerously close to her shoulder. A javelin out of nowhere came sailing in her direction. In a misstep, she toppled off the rock in a heap, landing on her elbow, barely escaping. With no time to catch her breath, she nicked the closest black rider in the leg. The point of his blade grazed her stomach. Struggling to scramble out of his reach, she found Flint. The Thatchers struggled to their feet, back to back. Flint was defenseless against the free-swinging battle axe, and Rona knew the next blow from either of her enemies would be her undoing. In the nick of time, an arrow hit the closest of Rona's attackers in the neck, sending him sprawling face first. Time, while going at its usual pace, seemed like it ticked slowly on for the twins. Rona swung her sword wildly at the man in front of her, noticing his wide open eyes and flaring nostrils. Talk. He retaliated, but Rona was wide open. Her recoil was too slow to block the blade. It Flint swallowed hard and ducked, the axe swinging for his head. As it whooshed by his ear, he panicked for Rona, but a sideways glance proved she was still there. Good thing she's short. Talk, and the seconds rattled on. Flint saw the axe man wind up again, saw his wide spreading grin. He reached for Rona behind him, fearing this was his final breath. Rona drove into him from behind, accidentally shoving him forward to the chest of the axe man. Flint didn't have time to gather himself and did the first thing that came to mind. He jabbed his fist as hard as he could into the man's jaw and landed the blow so suddenly and so decisively that the man spun away to regain his balance. Rona was now crabbing backward on her elbows, still holding her sword. Her attacker's eyes widened, signaling his killing stroke. Desperate, she brought the sword across her face just in time to block the blow, saving her neck from being severed. The Black Rider hit like a jackhammer. Rona wondered how her own sword didn't get driven into her skull from the force of it. He now stood over her, leaning his total weight on her sword. She quickly grabbed the hilt with the other hand, putting her back into the struggle. 
Pinned to the ground, Rona was out of options. Her face contorted from the strain. She let out a yell, using every ounce of her strength to throw him off. It didn't work. Flint! She cried out, hoping he could help her somehow. Flint was on his hands and knees now, looking up to only lock eyes with the axe man again. No, you don't! Flint could see the next move as if it had already happened. The man held his axe high and swung. He would come around and knock Flint's head clean off. Flint quickly closed his fists around two handfuls of mud and slung it at the man's face while pushing himself backward. The man with the axe gave a mighty cry and pawed the mud from his face, furious. Flint found himself next to his sister as she was losing her deadly test of strength with the black-clad swordsman, sword point in a deadly balance. Flint saw a beautiful opportunity and took it. From his sitting position, he reached over and grabbed her attacker by the knee. As he fell forward, Rona flipped him over her head. This put him at the receiving end of the spinning axe. Rona and Flint did their best to get to their feet. But now their backs were toward the precipice. More enemies were climbing up behind them. What now? They asked in unison. They heard a voice call out. Even if the command wasn't meant for them, it seemed like the only option they had. Flint quickly stooped low and grabbed the stone, and they both lunged forward, Rona pumping her sword wildly yelling, and Flint chucking rocks at the two black riders in front of them. The two men took a step backward and turned to meet a great mountain of a man, Priest Michael. He had just drawn his sword out of the chest of an unfortunate black rider who slumped to the ground, still. Turning in his only four moves, he back both the axe man and Rona's attacker. He was disciplined and poetic in every stroke. Violently intent and bold, he reminded Flint of a lion, his sword and staff a mere extension of his body, like claws. With only a little more fighting, the battle was done. Rona was breathless and felt the sting in her sprained wrists. Flint looked around, dazed. Everywhere, there was a person on the ground, black rider or friend, either bleeding or dead. Overcome by nausea, he blindly plunged down the hill to the meadow, half running, half sliding, and can be heard heaving at the bottom. Rona plopped onto a rock and shook her head in disbelief. Her hands trembled. I can't do this again. I have to get better at this sword thing. That or invent the first firearm. That was way too close a call. Way too close, she thought. Flint's imagination, paired with the movies he'd seen, had cooked up far gorier battles, but his reaction was out of his control. The blood and the emotionless dead eyes reached out and grabbed some part of his mind he was unaware of. Seeing real people, really dead, real blood, it was too much for his delicate psyche. Dizzy and weak from throwing up so hard, Flint could only hear himself breathing loudly. Flint wasn't long without comfort, the skinny hound timidly approached him and laid on the ground beside him. Flint sat there with the dog until Cardigan and Ed approached. He sent the hound away with a sharp look. She retreated a respectful distance, watching. You need to be more discerning, Flint. Cardigan grabbed Flint by the arm and raised him to his feet. And of better use to us. God hasn't spared you from wounds so you can sit under a tree. Go help them bury the dead. I, I can't do that. Flint retorted back. Ed suddenly reached up and snatched his glasses off his face and said, You will, if you want to have these again. Cardigan only raised an eyebrow and pointed Flint toward burial detail. We all have a duty to perform, my friend. Cardigan shouted after him. They're deranged. They're out to get me. I knew it. But he didn't have the energy to argue. Flint plodded through the forest with the assigned burial detail, and for the rest of the day, he carried Black Rider's bodies to a knoll and helped dig a shallow trench to bury them in. Without glasses, Flint's perception was off, and actually, that made it easier handling the bodies and digging monotonously. Still, the resentment had built when he first learned of his father's death. The hopelessness of getting back now clouded over him, threatening to lash out at any moment. Right now, his anger was aimed at Cardigan, but it could be someone else tomorrow. No one understands me except, except that stupid dog. Not even Rona. 
Flint kept shoveling. He had had quite a day, even if it ended digging graves. The other men around him shoveled dirt in a measured rhythm, but Flint had to often stop and rest. Flint had never handled a shovel a day in his life, and blisters were already forming on his hands, not to mention how his back ached. He mumbled his complaints during his frequent breathers, until the other men, who had said nothing so far, started passing knowing looks and chuckling at him. He at least had sense enough to go back to shoveling, but was unaware of the reputation he was building. In a world that honored courage and sacrifice, one he had supposedly studied so well, he was missing the point. He had always commented on those things in the classroom, shunning and judging fellow students who mocked courage and sacrifice, but it took more than words to dig graves. He took a hint finally when one guy next to him repeated an obscure proverb about whining women and leaky roofs from then on. He suffered in silence. He returned to base camp by early evening, hungry and sore. But he didn't see Rona until after he had eaten, and Ed unceremoniously tossed him his glasses. The food was pretty rough, besides the fact that it was undercooked. I can't wait for these people to discover salt and pepper, Flint said as he took the last bite. He was hungry enough, though, and ate it without really tasting it. Rona stumbled in from the dark, breathing shallow and coughing, moved straight to the fire, and leaned carefully up against a tree. You okay? Flint was less compassionate than he was curious. Did she even work hard today? I'm as good as I can be, considering we just had to put down some horses. Rona wearily forced herself to get food from the cauldron hanging over the fire and came back to Flint to eat at the edge of the light. Put down some horses? Why? Flint asked as he shoved his glasses higher on his nose. Because they rode through the picket line and sliced them up, that's why. There's no such thing as a vet around here, you know. Oh yeah, I guess so, huh? Flint shook his head, looking at his blisters. Uh, that's too bad. What have you been up to? Rona asked, blowing on her hot stew. I was part of the burial crew, so I did all the digging. Flint said blankly. I guess none of the Black Riders made it home, huh? Well, that kind of puts things in perspective. Rona said. Thinking of the gravity of Flint's afternoon labor versus her own, Flint only shrugged. Oh, oh, I can't eat this. I can't. Here, you want it? Rona turned her face away and handed the bowl to Flint. She wasn't squeamish. She just couldn't eat. She wasn't really that hungry anyway. Sure. Why? What's wrong? Flint took the bowl and started drinking the broth. Because I don't remember anyone killing a deer today, and the only fresh meat I know of... Oh, no way. Not the... Flint stood up, holding the bowl as if it were full of toxic chemicals. Not the horses. He walked off talking to himself about how cruel it all was. But Rona had a far more practical outlook. It's survival. At least we saved most of them. Her thoughts led back to how she had spent the afternoon alone, trying to gather up the horses and sew up the wounds that she could, removing arrows. It was grim. Four horses were seriously injured, and she had no way of tranquilizing them. She had to lay each one down, hobble its feet, and keep a blindfold over its eyes. She had to take the lives of two out of mercy. Three had died before she and some farmers even got there, and those didn't go to waste, obviously. While Flint had such a hard time accepting the brutality of a world where might made right, Rona was trying to adjust to the compassion she saw around her. In her periodic trips to and from the camp that day, she had seen Scarlet ceaselessly dressing wounds, Cardian and the others carrying the wounded to the cave or bringing them food and water. Thankfully, only a few of the resistance had been wounded and none were killed. But the most puzzling was the priest. She watched him with the wounded. He clasped hands closed his eyes and mumbled prayers or leaned in to listen to them, even smiling at them. His tally for black riders killed had to have been more than anyone's that day. Rona wasn't sure what this meant. It reminded her of Taft somehow, the same contradiction. The man who fought others for a living, sitting by a campfire reading a Bible. It just didn't fit her idea of Christianity nor add up to the peace and love message. A crunching sound behind Rona made her jerk and look over her shoulder. Cardigan, 
came into the light, followed by Priest Michael. It pleases me to see you well, lady. Hardigan said as he stepped in front of her and bowed slightly. We're not the Almighty on our side today. We, well, we... He seemed to lose his words when Rona looked up at him with her deadpan, so what, expression. We would have been overwhelmed. He finished and coughed as he turned to hear the priest say he was going to gather the others. Yeah, no kidding, Rona said flatly. She turned her disinterested gaze to the fire. Ardian cocked his head at her comment, but said nothing. He was apparently trying to figure out what no kidding meant. After a minute or two, Rona shrugged her shoulders and stood up. She was tired, and all she could think about was her pallet in the cave. I think I'm going to turn in. Nice talking to you. She took a step away and realized it was in the wrong direction. Ah, caves this way, she said, pointing uphill and turning on her heel. Permit me to escort you. He took her elbow and led the way with an outstretched palm. It was her sore elbow. She made a face, but tried to smile. She hoped he would let go, but he didn't. Hey, uh, no offense, but... She removed his hand. I think I can make it. He released her arm gently, but still walked beside her. The silence was awkward now, even for Rona. You don't have to come. I can find the... Ow! Rona stumbled over a rock as she spoke prompting Cardian to catch her by the arm. My way. She shook free rather abruptly. She decided not to let the time go to waste. Okay, maybe you can answer a question for me then. Who is the guy you call the priest? Is he some kind of master sword fighter or something? A hired gun, um, knight type guy? Or is he a real priest? Rona, becoming more aware that they spoke a different language, she prepared herself to decode his answer. No, he's a priest. Cardigan spoke casually. No amount of forethought prepared Rona for that answer. You gotta be kidding me. Forgive me, I do not understand what you mean. Cardigan's eyes narrowed. Then he continued. My brother Lachlan and I were left in his care as youths. I had not seen him since he was sent away. It is good to have him with us. Oh yeah, I forgot you had a brother. Rona said, her thoughts divided. They stopped at the entrance of the cave, and Cardian stepped aside so she could enter first. He didn't see her roll her eyes as she passed. Hey, psst, real quick. Let's hear a word from our awesome sponsors who make this show possible. Then we'll get back to the episode. Hello, 1232 listeners. This is Callie Sue, and I'm excited to tell you about Dramify, the ultimate platform for creators and fans of audio dramas. With oodles of genres, hundreds of shows, and thousands of episodes, Dramafy is your go-to streaming service exclusively for family-friendly audio dramas. Whether you're a devoted listener or a creator of a family-friendly masterpiece, Dramafy has something for you. And guess what, 1232 listeners? You can now enjoy 1232 on Dramafy. Just go to dramafy.com forward slash 1232. That's D-R-A-M-A-F-Y.com slash 1232 and get started for free. Happy listening. 1232 is brought to you by Rumble Stump Entertainment, owned and operated by me, Jet, and my wife, Callie Sue. We love what we do, but each of these episodes requires a ton of work. Although they're awesomely fun to create, each one requires about 300 hours of work from us and our talented team members. So, if you find what we are doing valuable, support us on patreon.com by subscribing to Rumble Stump. Link in the description below. Thank you for supporting the arts. Back to the episode. The torches in the cave revealed a very high ceiling, creating the illusion that it was much bigger than it actually was. The wounded lay on pallets made of leafy branches or heather, while the rest stood around the entrance, waiting. Daphid ran to Cardigan and leapt into his arms, burying his little face in Cardigan's shoulder, crying. (laughs) Rona was immediately puzzled. She couldn't understand what the little boy was trying to say. Priest Michael came over and placed a hand on Rona's shoulder and one on Cardigan and looked them in the eye. Our sister, Conan, is taken captive. His mighty shoulders burdened by the news and Rona could read the concern in his grip. But in his face, he had that same look in his eyes that Karin had. The look that said, peace. Rona clenched her jaw. 
Remembering how Karn had told them she would give her life for freedom, the boy's sobs lent a heavy sadness as the others knew his grief. Cardigan held him close for a moment before speaking. Then, friends, we have no time to waste. We must put a plan into action. Doff had loosed his grip on Cardigan, and without warning, leapt toward Rona, his arms outstretched. Instinctively, she reached out for him. He continued to cry on her shoulder. She wasn't sure what to do. She could feel herself wanting to comfort him somehow. Lady Rona, would you take Daffod outside? He need not remain with us. Yeah, um, sure. Sure. She carried Daffod outside the cave to the ledge where she and Flint had fought and sat down. He wouldn't let go of her neck, and she didn't really want him to. Deep down, his sobs echoed in her heart. Her mind reeled backward, returning to the days after her mother's death. She had cried just like this for hours alone on her bed. Rona remembered her conscious decision to lock her heart and throw away the key. But somehow, Dafit's crying was prying it open again. She said nothing to him, but held him as long as he needed to be held. Karn may yet make it back, but she dared not give the little guy false hope. Her gut told her Karin was already dead, and Dafid too, must have known it. He exhausted himself with a fresh wave of tears, unable to breathe normally. Rona just held him, having for the first time in her memory genuine compassion for another's suffering. Inside, Cardigan unashamedly leaned on the priest's arm, laden with the weight of grief. Not just for Karin, but all that his people had been enduring. Priest Michael put Cardigan at arm's length and smiled. Lad, you've not grown a bit taller for all the worrying you must have done in that cell. The priest said this in his lilting accent. Cardigan and the priest, along with the others, gathered around. The torchlight flickered frantically because of the draft, casting suspense over the priest's words. I knew Karen would be in danger the moment I returned with supplies. So I left immediately and traveled back for her. I came to the edge of Brecon Town by nightfall yesterday and found the blacksmith's house in ashes. Cannon and Daffod left with me in that terrible storm sent by the intervention of the Almighty. We fled on foot into the forest, trying to throw off the hunters, but they caught up to us. Somehow, Karen was taken in the mist. He stopped, his eyes filled with tears, his head drooped. All were quiet while the big man fought to compose himself. At last, squeezing the tears out of his eyes, he raised his head and continued. I was carrying the boy as we ran. The mist was thick around us. The dogs were close at hand. We were only a short distance from the horses. Karen was at my elbow, and then I turned to call to her. They dragged her to Castle Brecken, I'm sure of it. The boy, bless him suffered greatly in witnessing her capture. God has his purposes. We find comfort in this. Know that he will bring his wrath upon his enemies, and to know he comforts his own in their distress. He stopped talking while he mopped the sweat from his forehead. Your boy and I were hunted all night by the company that rode in on our heels this morning. The Scotsman's weariness pulled him down, and he looked beaten. Guardian got up and strode to the entrance, anger and grief at once filling his heart. He turned and paced back to the table and dropped to his knees, matching the gaze of each man. He then bowed his head. Brothers, we ought to go to the Lord. All of them bowed their heads, and the priest knelt beside Cardian, half leaning on his staff. Cardian then prayed. Hear a just cause, O Lord. Attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer from lips free of deceit. From your presence, let my vindication come. Let your eyes behold the right. You've tried my heart. You've visited me by night. You've tested me and you will find nothing. I have purposed that my mouth will not transgress with regard to the works of man. One by one, the other men joined in, reciting the words of Psalm 17 in unison so that their voices filled the echoing cave. By the word, By the word of your lips, I have avoided the ways of the wild. My steps have held fast to your hands. 
My feet have not slept. I call upon, upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me, hear my words. One of the children of Stas love, O Savior of those who seek refuge in your adversaries at your right hand. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadows of your wings. From the wicked who do me violence, my deadly enemies who surround me, they close their hearts to pity. With their mouths they speak arrogantly. They have now surrounded our steps. They set our eyes to cast to the ground. The priest's voice became louder, his conviction unmistakable. Like a lion eager to tear, as a young lion lurking in ambush, arise, O oh Lord, confront Zoriel and her nest of traitorous servants, subdue them, deliver our souls and our beloved sister from the wicked by your sword and from men by your hand, O oh Lord, from men of the world whose portion is in this life. There was a pause and a hush as each man spoke the last words of the psalm led out by the priest who stood as he spoke. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. Looking around at each other, their strength rising, Smith ventured a comment to Cardigan across the room. Even if all we have is taken away, there is still the inheritance of eternal life. Karen knows this as well. She had stronger faith than most of us here. He was not used to speaking to an audience and so fell silent. Cardigan gave him an approving nod and glanced at the priest. We have only a few hours to save her life. But her sentence will be carried out as soon as they have questioned her. Cardigan, now standing, said this for everyone to hear. Then let us take action. Edward said boldly. It may be too late already. Priest Michael said firmly. But it would be best to send only a few men, lightly armed, to the gates with the people who enter in the morning. Is there no way to get inside the walls? Cardigan said, knowing there was a way to get into the castle by the tunnels, but only a few men at a time could fit. And even with that advantage, the fortress was too well guarded for a sneak attack. Cardigan, my son, she is expecting us. Bear that in mind. Priest Michael warned. In the end, they decided to enter through the gates at dawn, disguised as slaves. They were counting on the fact that Zorial would make Karn's execution public. Smith would go through the gates with one other to discover the circumstances, and they would then return to Cardigan and Ed, who would wait in the wood. All agreed that capturing Karn was a trick to provoke them into an open battle. They remained at the table a long time, discussing possible tactics, while the torches still flickered from the gentle wind outside that wafted into the cave. Zalfit had finally cried himself to sleep in Rona's arms. She couldn't explain it, but she had gotten past the awkwardness of caring and had completely lost herself in Dafid's grief. In a way, it had become her own. Slow tears cut a path down her face but she didn't dry them. It seemed better to just leave them alone, stinging as they fell. She must have been sitting there for over an hour, looking up at a clear night sky for the first time since they arrived. The stars were more brilliantly clear than she had ever seen. And maybe that was what finally penetrated her heart at last. She thought of her mother, Mary Catherine Thatcher, and how life was always such a celebration to her. For Rona, the stars were a special thing. They had watched over her own despair as a child, and now she couldn't ignore how their beauty and clarity offered hope. No matter what goes on in a day, no matter how hot or how cloudy, they're up there, behind it the whole time, always there doing their thing. Huh. They shine even when we can't see them. Rona reflected on that a moment. The more she thought, the more uncomfortable she became. The words on her father's tombstone haunted her, for we walk by faith and not by sight. She was startled from her reflections by the sound of someone coming up the path. Rona knew there were watchmen nearby, 
but still stiffened at the sound. Then, by the light cast out of the cave entrance, she could see that it was Flint and the stray dog. For a fleeting second, she was glad to see her brother and wanted to talk to him. Psst, Flint, Rona whispered, trying not to wake Daffod. Mm, Rona, is that you? Flint stopped, blinking into the dark. Yeah, come over here. Flint felt his way over to her, while the timid dog crouched and skirted the light. Hey, what are you doing out here? He asked sitting beside her, shuddering at the gruesome attack that happened only hours before on that very spot. Well, apparently Karin was taken prisoner this morning, so we have to- No! Oh my gosh, that, that's awful. Really? He wasn't faking his concern, but to Rona, it sounded over-dramatized. Her body made an involuntary shivering motion. Her previous sensitive thoughts clammed up. So Daffod is an orphan now, right? Flint said, just spilling his thoughts with no regard for the sleeping child. Yeah, Flint, he's an orphan. Rona tried to keep her voice hushed. Unless they can spring her in real soon, she'll probably be gone for good. That's my guess anyway. Oh no, this is so sad. I mean, it's just awful, really. Can you imagine how alone this little guy is? He has nobody in the world now. First, he lost his mom and dad, and now he lost Karen. The, the woman who cared for him since birth, practically, and who knows? I mean, Cardigan might not live long enough to be an actual presence in his life and him being in such a dangerous place. Flint recounted how he imagined Doff had felt, and the boy, who had been sound asleep, now stirred in Rona's arms. Shh, you bonehead. You want to hurt him some more? Keep talking about it. Besides, you should know how it feels. You don't have any parents either. Rona spat out in a whisper, not wanting to raise her voice. Her comment must have hit its mark. A long silence followed before Flint said, Will they try to break Karen free tonight? I don't know any of that. Rona raised her left eyebrow as she spoke, a sure sign she was getting mad. As soon as Rona spoke, the hound jumped up and took off, running into the dark. What's the matter, Scooby? Scooby! Flint called after the dog. Scooby? Are you serious? You named the thing Scooby? Yeah, Scooby. I didn't have a name, so I named it. Wow. Scarlet came out of the cave and approached them, carrying in her hand a loaf of bread. In every kind of light, this mute girl was at once common and mysteriously attractive. She knelt beside Rona and handed her the bread. She rubbed little Daffod's back as she knelt there, half smiling at Rona compassionately. Rona didn't know how to respond. I'll help you with the horses in the morning. Rona offered weakly to Scarlet's parting nod. How did you know I was starving? Biting into the bread, she was grateful for Scarlet's voluntary kindness. In a quick glance, she caught Flint trying to wink at Scarlet. Rona couldn't tolerate him right now. Can you go somewhere else, please? Rona fell asleep outside with little Daffod, and sometime in the middle of the night, woke to find that they were covered by a blanket. She woke once more in the pre-dawn dark when Cardigan, Smith, and some others left camp on horseback. You've been listening to episode 17 of 1232, produced by Rumble Stump Entertainment. Written by Callie Sue and Cheyenne Bell. Narrated by Callie Sue. Today's voice talents include Robin Cage as Rona Thatcher, Corey Keller as Flint Thatcher, Kaylin Landry as Daffod, Matt Burke as Cardigan, Sid Goodlow as Priest Michael, Mike Darling as Smith, and Garrett Goodlow as Edward. This episode was mixed and engineered by Jet Black, with editing and sound design by Casey Caballero, Caballero Sounds. Music by Callie Sue and Jet Black. Mastered by Zach Bryant, Nineman Mastering. Cover art by Niall C. Grant. Continue the adventure in episode 18. <laughs>